know, people, we all start where we start and we all do our journey the way that works the best for us. So I try not to judge. And, you know, I have people that I did it with for three weeks and then we come back a year later and say, oh, you, could we do this again? And I say, sure thing, let's do it again. And so it's kind of like a catch up of what's happened in their life also in the last. So it really is this sober community that we have to me. And I've got, I am very blessed with the people around me in my life. But the people that I have met in the last 11 years, I have to say, are the most creative the most genuine, the kindest, the most sensitive people I've ever met in my life. Welcome to Amy Liz Harrison's podcast, Eternally Amy, a mum of eight's journey from jail to joy, a Gen Xer who overcame her struggle with alcohol to become a best-selling author and mental health advocate. She shares stories of hope and offers ideas for others struggling with mental health challenges. One thing is for sure, you'll leave with something to chew on. And now, here's your host, Amy Liz Harrison. Greetings, compadres. It is not every day that I get to have a guest on who uh, has literally changed my life. And um, today I get to. And so I just would invite you to open your heart to Kim Bellis. She is the founder and creator of Sober is the New Cool. And I'm going to start by telling you her bio, and then I'm going to tell you how we met in person. And I just know that you will just be beyond blessed by this woman's sheer presence, even after recording, you know, down the line, whenever this is that you encounter this episode. I just know that because that's how it worked for me, is the universe put her in my life when I needed her. And I'm so thankful for that. So, okay, I'm not going to get verklempt. I'm going to jump into the bio. So here's what I need to tell you about Kim to start off with. In 2013, Kim's 13-year-old son, Matthew, began having grand mal seizures, turning their world upside down. So as a mother, her first reaction was naturally centered on fixing the situation, as many of you can relate, right? With medication being the only solution and alcohol a definite no for his future, Kim committed to abstaining from drinking for three months, proving to her son that alcohol and drugs weren't necessary for a good time. Encountering unexpected social pressures at the age of 52, Kim realized that the challenges of navigating a world that often glamorizes drinking was a little more than she bargained for. So what started as a personal challenge turned into a realization that not drinking brought significant benefits. Prioritizing her son, Matthew, she created Sober as the New Cool to address those pressures, right? And to spare Matthew from having to explain why he didn't drink. 11 years ago, when discussions about the shame and the stigma surrounding mental health and addiction were scarce, Kim created a Facebook page. I love it when a good idea starts from a Facebook page. The response was overwhelming, reaching the UK, the US, and other countries eager to discuss normalizing being sober. So Kim's role over the past 11 years has been to rebuild others' self-esteem, emphasizing that nobody should have to wait until they're 60 to recognize their self-worth. Love it. Through the I Am exercise, which we'll hear about, I'll definitely ask her about that, uh, where she shares positive words daily, which I've seen, Kim helps others rediscover forgotten qualities. 
she believes in the strength of supportive relationships, especially in the early stages of sobriety. So understanding that sobriety is a unique journey for each individual, she helps others find different avenues that work for them. As Sober is the New Cool has grown, Kim has been blessed with others becoming Sober as the New Cool ambassadors worldwide. So Kim emphasizes the importance of connection as the key to hope, health, and happiness. Sending messages of hope and inspiration daily, she brightens someone's world, feels blessed to have reinvented herself with passion and pride. And I can tell you from a personal level, she does this beautifully. So as I mentioned, sometimes in life we intersect with people who uh, are brought to us serendipitously right when we need them the most. And so as you listeners know, I wrote this book, Mommy Goes to Meetings, and as an author, I've chosen like the two hardest genres to self-publish, right? Memoir slash nonfiction and children's. And I won't mince words when I say that um, I was about, I had gone through a little spell uh, where I was about ready to just throw in the towel. Um, It had kind of come on the heels of having several bad uh, reviews from other authors, other people in the author community uh, who basically didn't understand my book, even though I had given a lot of disclaimers about it, tried to explain what it was. Uh, But the end of the day was the end of the day was they didn't care for it. And everybody's entitled to their opinion. uh, But it just it got to weighing so heavily on me that I just thought, you know what, maybe I should just go back to journaling, you know, as I've done my whole life. I don't really know why I'm trying to spread my messages out to the world. You know, people aren't asking for this. Maybe it's just bombarding them with too much. Maybe I'm fire hosing people or whatever. And so At that time, my dear friend, Elise Bryson, who's the founder of The Sober Curator, which is the collective I belong to and write for, uh, sent me some screenshots from Kim's Instagram stories. And I'm a little slow with socials, as you know, um, and that's because I've got all these kids. I, I can't really be online all day as much as the algorithms require. And so I miss things. And I was blown away by the screenshots that Elise sent me from Kim's stories. And I started crying because Kim loved my book. Kim loved it and was talking about it profusely, like for a long time. And I I, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe that there was a soul out there who was willing to not only say, hey, I like this book, but hey, it's, you know, available for consumption by people who need it. And here's why I like it. And so I just burst into tears because um, what happened next was I met Kim in person in New York for Break Free uh, Fashion Week. And what you see is what you get. She really, Kim exudes positivity. She radiates love, unconditional love, non-judgmental love. And I could not be more grateful for the universe placing you in my life, Kim, when the universe did. And so I am so thrilled to welcome you today. And I love the fact that you said yes to coming on. So thank you for coming on. I'm I'm just so honored to be here. You know, I've watched your podcasts and, and listened to them for quite some time. I knew you also through our sweet Elise and the sober curator. 
And, you know, when this book came out, for me, you know, I have so many young mothers, and I mean, and grandmothers, and daughters, and, and people, and I hear so many different stories. And when I saw this book, I was like so touched by it that I had to go online on a Sunday morning because I do Sunday morning picks for people that, like you, are busy during the week. And I try and put the best posts that I've seen that touch me, hoping they're going to touch somebody else. And when I, I tried to do yours over and over with the book in front of me and reading it, and I just couldn't get through it without crying the, my page that, to me, just always, I always read. And the response that I got from so many was like, because I love books. I love to hold something. I'm not want somebody online to read. I don't know, maybe because I'm old, but I love a book. I love the fact that you did the illustrations. I love the fact that it takes away the ugliness of people's judgment and, and not wanting to discuss the problems that are so evident right now in our world, not only with mental health, but addiction and et cetera. And for me, I just felt like after I did it the first time, I got so many people talking about it. I had to redo it again because I thought this book, there's just too many young moms and older moms that had said to me, if only I'd had this book when my children were growing up. And they brought them to tears. And I thought, this has to go viral. It has to go viral because... And every time, yesterday I was talking to a mother that's going to open a rehabilita um, rehab center here in Canada for her son that's now um, addiction free. And she was saying, how am I going to get the community involved? How am I going to talk about this? Because nobody really wants to talk about this unless their child, husband, mother, whatever, has an issue. And I thought, okay, this meeting is going sideways. This is not going the way. And I, whether I was going to help them or not was irrelevant. And I took out your book because I always have it right by my side. And I read what the page. And she literally broke down in tears. And sa I said, I'll send one to you tomorrow. And this is the way you'll be able to talk to somebody about it. And she said, you have no idea how it touched me. And this is what I get every time I talk about your book. And then when I met you in New York City and there we were in the back getting all glammed up and whatever, I had to take it out and read it again in front of everybody because I thought, what better place than all these women that are in fashion, that are here for mental health or addiction, they should know about this. Mm -hmm. And I know you kind of went, what are you doing? <laughs> but oh well, it's okay. And everybody loved it. So I am grateful to have met you. I love what I do. Um, unfortunately, we don't get to save everybody. So that breaks my heart. But for the people I can help, I will continue to help. And if I find something as positive and as wonderful as your books for families to be able to heal and grow and have no shame, I, I know I'm doing, I'm, I'm exactly where I should be, you know? And I really think I'm the lucky one to have met you. I really do because meeting you lets me help somebody else. And I think that's what it's all about. Yeah. Well, you're, you're so right. And I, I so appreciate that. And what I would love to do, first of all, thank you, but, um, you're so right. And that's the thing. It's about connection, right? And, mm -hmm. and making these connections and helping each other and being able to just go, oh, I've got a tool over here. You might want to mm -hmm. try and, oh, what about this? And, and I love that. I love that so much. And on that note, I'm wondering if you can take me back in time and hop in the time machine and rewind to when you first got sober and how you started up sober is the new cool and how it grew into what it is today well over 11 years ago my son Matthew was an avid football player we were like you know this football family he was out 
five times a week playing football. And when from one day to the next, he started having grand mal seizures. The first seizure, they assumed right away it was a concussion due to football. Mm. And the hospital said, oh, he's fine. He can play again. And as a mom, I didn't really love that. But, you know, who was I? I didn't know. You know, I thought, okay, he's, he's, you know, if the doctor says it's okay, it's okay. Football for him was what made him feel valuable and important. That was his whole world. So after the second seizure, I said, that's it. That's all. We're, we're done. And then they realized quickly after that, uh, that in fact, he was epileptic. He would be on medication the rest of his life. So our life went really so upside down so fast to, you know, a kid playing football, basketball, uh, soccer, everything to me not letting him ride a bicycle with a helmet because I didn't know when the next seizure was going to happen. Mm-hmm. And before the medication was really going to be in effect, they had to do it slowly. And they still, to this day with epilepsy, it's kind of like, you're lucky if you get the meds right. So in between all that, we started on the medicine. He was good for about three, four months. And then I said, okay, that's it. Now you're not that basement, the video games and all this nonsense you're you're going out back into the world you're going to see your friends and half an hour after he'd get out he'd call me and say come and get me so the third time he said mom I just I can't do this and I said why I don't get it I just he said mom they all either smoke pot or they drink and I don't fit in anywhere and I was like, wow, okay. And I said, this is such nonsense, Matthew. You do not need alcohol to have fun in your life. And as I said it, I had the biggest glass of red wine in my hand. And as I say it now, even 13 years later, I think it, I can remember thinking you are the biggest hypocrite walking to have just said that to him. And when you drink wine every single night, like... And so I said, I'm going to do three months. Don't ask me why. It was just like, I'm, I'm here. I'm your mom. We're, we're going to get through this. We did the three months. And then he said, okay, mom. He said, now you could be like everybody else again. And I was like, wow. No, 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 no. And in those three months, everywhere I went, people first started to say, you don't have a problem, number one. Number two, come here in the corner. We'll have a drink. We won't tell. And I thought, wow, I've made a promise to my child. And people are saying, come and break your promise. To me, right there, that was a problem. To them telling me I didn't have a problem. When even after three months, I slowly started to realize, oops, you know what? Maybe I was drinking a little too much. And alcohol had been an issue in my family. I was not... um, you know, we had had problems with alcohol in our family, with family members before. So I wasn't a stranger to those things. And then six months came. And then I, and then I said with my sister, she made the logo. So it was the new cool. I got a trademark. Don't ask me why. It's like on a kitchen island. We're doing this. I'm 52. I don't have a Facebook page. and But my son, Matthew, for some reason, all this time is embarrassed to have to say why he can't drink. He doesn't want to tell people he's epileptic. And I'm thinking, imagine if he was an addict and he had to say, I can't drink. This is, he's got a medical condition. And I thought, this is just doesn't make, it just wasn't making sense to me. And, you know, our life was, I guess I was lucky in the way that because he was sick and I wanted to support him, it was all about him. So I didn't focus so much on me and why I couldn't drink because I was so uh, afraid of him having seizures. And the first year we had 11 seizures, even with the medication, because there were times where, yes, we went to the park at the backpack with the boys and beer or whatever they drank. So that was not so uh, ideal because the ambulance would come. And but they were learning lessons for for him. And he wanted to be like everybody else. That's basically because alcohol is like everywhere. And it's like if you're sad, if you're happy, if you're 
celebrating. If you know, there's always a reason it seems that people are saying, have a drink. And so at that moment, we made the Facebook page. And from the UK, I had just tons of people sending messages and how can I do this? And how did you stop? And I was like, well, I got hypnotized. I did this. I started meditating and I don't sit well, like I'm somebody that moves a lot. So it was to this day, it's still hard for me to do that meditation and kind of slow down. So I, but the more the days went and the more the months came, it just, there was like, not even like, even when I think, oh, I wish I could have a glass of champagne right now with everybody else, it would come and go very quickly because of everything that was going on around me. And Matthew was my my priority. It's that simple. That's what I was doing. And then all these other people were saying, we don't have anybody to talk to. We can't find anything online. And I was like, that doesn't make sense. And there has to be something bigger than me, bigger than everything that happened in my life, because it seemed every time I opened my phone or my computer, I was at the right place at the right time, sending the right message or somebody was calling me or sending me a message. Would you like to uh, help us find people? We are located in this area. We have not, and I don't care what you do, whether it's AA, meditation, yoga, because I think it's, not one size fits all. I think as many things as you can do when you're in recovery is Mm -hmm. the way to do it. And connection for me. And I just thought, okay, how am I going to do this? And I think I had a lot of young women, especially at the beginning, because I was like the mom that wasn't going to judge. I was the mom that wasn't going to scream. I was the mom that could say things and they could get a little bit uh, up tighter, not so happy with what I said, but they would somehow take it. And then I'd say, okay, I'm going to send you a word morning and night. And it's only one word and you have to send me one back. And the first girl, and I have never had a daughter. I'm, I, you know, I, so I feel now I have daughters all over the world. And the first young woman um, that I came into contact was from the UK and her name is Natty. We unfortunately lost her last week, but she was the sparkle and she was so filled with life and she was so ready to help so many people through all the problems she had. And we had seven years of her being in London and me being in Montreal by WhatsApp, doing a matching tattoo. I would not change one word one day Um, for all the sadness I feel in my heart right now because I've had so many people send me messages about her about what she did for them and how she encouraged them so I knew then I guess when I met her somehow there's eight billion people in this world and after her it was just like one after another and I met a wonderful Kelly Marie she's a nurse and um, she was doing the I am with me. And so I, I, she sent me a word, I am hardworking. And I said, no, Kelly, you're not hardworking. You are dedicated. And her whole face changed. It means the same thing, really, but not really, because dedicate and her whole attitude shifted. And I realized at that moment, people need, we always remember all the things that are wrong ourselves it's so hard to look in the mirror and say I like my nose or I like my face or I like my smile or I I'm a I've got a good heart we all seem to think about the negative things and I just thought okay this is the way I can do it and the more days and months that passed I just realized alcohol was not my friend I had been drinking too much and I was I just knew I couldn't have another sip because I didn't want to lose what I found because my world I think was always pretty good, but I was living half a life as opposed to a full life. And now it's just like, it's incredible. It's just things that have happened. Like you and I walking in fashion week, come on. Like that just, that, that's like dream kind of TV movie stuff, you know, yeah. but it has all this meeting you, an author of a book. And my husband couldn't believe you did the illustrations. 
all the women, like the doctors, the 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 nurses, the the fathers, the sober fathers that are taking back their life and taking care of their children. What? Well, and they're sharing their life with me. They think I'm valuable enough to tell their hopes, their dreams, and and you know what what what's wrong in their life. How much God? That's like amazing that somebody thinks that much of me. That I would I would keep their 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 confidence and and be kind, I guess, and not judgmental. So I just love what I do, and so is the new cool. Just it's like, I don't know how I got here. It just, and whenever I just kind of thought, okay, I'm done. I, you know, I'm not doing enough. I'm not, you know, saving enough people. I'm not, you know, if I hear one more mother say she's lost a child to fentanyl or, or drugs, you know, and then somehow the next day I wake up and there was another sign and just another sign. And, another sign. and here I am 11 years later loving loving my life you know and and I promise to keep last week I thought I was done I thought no I, I can't and then I thought no I have to continue this because there's too many people that need and deserve the life that they should have without alcohol and drugs mm. okay I'm obsessed with all of this um and I absolutely love it because um you know we i i firmly believe that like at least for me i find what i'm looking for right so if i'm in a tailspin and a negative kind of a state of mind um whether that's i've let outside circumstances affect my attitude or which I do let happen all the time. And I wish I didn't, uh, but I'm a work in progress and that, you know, I'm working on it. Uh, but what I love is that, you know, you'd wake up in the morning and you would see another sign. And I feel like you got to be looking for those. Like you have to at least have the open heartedness, you know, to let those things make themselves present in your life for you to see them. And so I see that positivity in you that, you know, oh yeah, maybe I think I'm done. And then the next day, oh, well, there's another sign. I love that because it's another guidepost, right? It's another mile marker of like, nope, time to keep going, time to keep going. And, you know, it. it's just another mystical kind of experience where it's like, oh, this is, this is about more than me. This yes. is about a journey and, um, helping others and that snowballs, you know, mm -hmm. and that's powerful. Um, one thing that I picked up on from the beginning of your story that I hadn't realized is that Matthew played football. Yeah. And so my third born, my son, um, plays football and I can tell you from one football mom to another, um, I don't, I mean, I've had, you know, athletes before, right. But like, that is the sport that is, um, it just really, when you, when you play football, right. And you're a football player and you are passionate about the game, to have that taken away, it is there's a, a no greater nightmare for for a child or a teenager of that age and, and delicate time period in life where they're figuring things out and they're gaining their self-esteem and and to have that ripped away is horrible. Or the even the concept of having it ripped away. I know my son was one concussion away from being told you can't do this anymore. Um, and had that happened um to him, I'm not sure that he would be where he is at today without football. I just I I know that he wouldn't be. I just don't even know what would have happened. And so um immediately I zeroed in on that because you know, 
how do you fill that hole? How do you yeah. replace that? And I think that the natural tendency for most teens or a lot of people, as you mentioned, it's like, well, I need to escape this feeling. Yeah. So that's really difficult, especially as a teenager. And here are all your peers in their experimentation phases. I just, that must have been really tough. And how is he doing today? Now he's six years seizure free. Yay. So yeah, we he's January 28th, six years seizure free. Um, but life has been really rough for him. You know, we had a lot of, um, you know, how could you not be depressed having that ripped away from you? And that was his self-esteem. That's what somebody had once said to him, that's what you do. That's not who you are. But for him, it was who he was. Yep. Football was his world. And to this day, it's slowly, you know, he's got a job at a bank. Everything's like starting to, you know, really, because COVID, once COVID came, school was hard. We would sit in a parking lot and wait for him because during the last 11 years, we had moments of a year or so of uh, being seizure free. And I may say one thing, the doctors um, here had said, oh, well, you can have one or two drinks. So I don't know who in their right mind would say that to a teenager because I don't know many teenagers that have one or two on a regular that to have no um, epilepsy. So for them to tell him that, and or you could smoke marijuana. Mm. So that was really hard, and so I think the first year that's why he did try a few times to have some beers and things like that. And then we'd be a year seizure free, and then something would happen, and then. So it was very up and down and we'd sit in the parking lot, wait for him because he was afraid to take the bus or the train to get to school. And school was hard because his medication makes him like very zen and very like, like so <laughs> how do you concentrate and how do you read a book and like pay attention? Like it's, it was just, but we are here. He is in a great spot. Um, he's, you know, I can't believe actually I was lucky enough that he did not go down the road of substance abuse and or something else because, you know, so many people would have, it would have been just that easy to thing to do like the, and he, you know, we worked really hard. We saw a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists. And I remember once being with him and the, the doctor had said, okay, you guys have to like do like a one-on-one, -on -one, like face each other and say something. And Matthew said, I don't know where to start. And I said, I'll start. And I said, I feel like a failure as a mother. And the tears just started to roll down my face because I kept saying, well, you, you're not having a seizure. You're okay. You're okay. I wasn't listening. I wasn't getting all the other things that were going along with it because I just wanted so badly to fix him and make everything okay and I think that's kind of what I do as I've always done so it was it was very hard for me to not do that with him and then finally at year six when we thought okay now we had like two years seizure free my and my husband and I never went anywhere one would leave the other one would stay home it was that simple no vacations no nothing and because he had had a seizure on a plane once. So we weren't getting on a plane either. And so um, at year six, we decided, OK, he was able to drive. The doctors had said he was fine. We rented a house about an hour and a half away from where we live. He would come and go. And that summer, I could have ripped everybody's glass of wine out of their hand because I was no longer in control of him or the situation it was focused on me and what was going on and all of a sudden I had to deal with all these other feelings right because up until then it was all about Matthew mm -hmm. and you know and I had to like and then I was like I'm not saying this I stopped for Matthew anymore I stopped for me and I'm much happier without alcohol and I started to talk about it like I talk about the sunshine because I thought People have to get it. And if I pretend that it's something other than what it is, I'm not doing myself any service or anybody else. 
And I think that's when I got free, even though it was the roughest point, those two months out of the 11 years, I think that was the hardest point. Yeah. That transition to owning it for yourself must have been kind of, I mean, difficult for sure, but also crucial, right? Mm -hmm. To sort of like, okay, now this is kind of morphing into, I'm actually, now I'm doing this for me, you know? And that's, that's amazing. That's key. That's powerful. And I'm like dying to know about, because I saw you the other day on um, Facebook doing the I am um, exercise. And so can you like talk us through that a little bit? So basically when I I meet somebody, because I don't pretend to be a coach I'm that's just not I'm not qualified as far as I'm concerned. What I can be is a friend, a you know, a semi sponsor, a mother figure. I can do a lot of things. But when it comes to being a coach, I don't like to say I'm no matter what 11 years, 12 years into recovery. It's not my bag. Mm. But I can empower somebody to find their qualities that they forget, because I think that part of addiction It's not just the alcohol or the drugs. I think it's a lack of Mm self-esteem. I think somewhere, somehow, something went wrong and people stopped believing that they were capable or somebody put them down enough that they forgot the value that they have in this world. So I send one word in the morning and I did do this with my Matthew and my older son. Every morning I went and I got like a little billboard and I write, I am, and I write a positive word in front. So when they'd wake up to go shower or whatever, that was the first thing they saw and one before bed. And so when people were asking me, well, what can I do? And I thought, well, this is what I can do with them. This is easy. Well, easy. It was a lot, very time consuming having to send these out because to me, was really getting to know somebody. And at the beginning, it's very easy. It's like, okay, you like sports, you're an artist, so you're creative, you're this, you're passionate, you're uh, sporty, you're funny. The words come very quickly. Hmm. But then comes, I think about week three, if people really stick to it with me and do it morning and night, all of a sudden, it's words like honest. Hmm. It's words like worthy. And those hard those words, people don't, they just don't believe it when they say it. Like they write it and, and and it's kind of like, and I had one young woman, Jackie, she was a grade five teacher. And she, when she started with me, she was like, we were going back and forth. And I'd say, Jackie, that's not the right word. Come on, give me a word. You already wrote that word. Come on, Jackie, there's something in there. And she said after six months, she posted on Instagram saying, I couldn't find the words at the beginning. And now six months in, I can find so many words. And I start the day teaching my grade five class with every child has to do an I am. Ah, I love it. And I still speak to Jackie today. She's going to get married. She's in a wonderful place. And I think that her too, it was just a matter of finding or remembering, you know, I am funny. I am talented. If I'm a teacher, I have to be dedicated. I I am capable. I am. And it was okay to be sensitive. It was okay to be sad. And even when she'd say sad, I'd say, okay, well, that's not really positive. But the fact that you can share it. So let's do something with that. So I wouldn't like necessarily say okay that's a bad word I just say okay how can we make that into like you're sharing or you're open you know so yeah. that change the fact that yeah you could still be sad but we're dealing with it now as opposed to you know trying to like stuff it down you know which so many people do and it works with men it works with women it works with teenagers it works with and it's incredible. It's just you when you see the eyes light up, because a lot of times I do do um, WhatsApp because a lot of people are in the UK or in the United States or somewhere else. And they like to see do 
you know, that connection where they feel something and you see it in their eyes when the words start to click. And I thought, I don't want somebody to wait till they're 60 like me to say, I am worthy mm -hmm. and believe it. That doesn't mean I can't improve because a lot of people go, oh, that's egotistical, right? To start saying nice things about yourself, but it's not. No. Because if you if you don't love yourself, how are you going to take care of your kids or your mother or your father or your life if you don't feel worthy enough of a good life? You can't give from something you don't have. A hundred percent agree. Totally. In fact, in rehab, I distinctly remember Kim doing this exercise. I had a counselor who was a shaman. And he would often have me do these ritualistic, weird things, like fantastic things that I never would have done before. But it was, you know, partially about just learning to follow direction. But it was also like, huh, could it be that maybe this will work, even though I don't understand it and I feel uncomfortable, right? And it had a profound impact on me. But one of the things that to this day, I still kind of struggle with that he did teach me. And I'm like, okay, I'm hearing that I, I got to keep working on that. And I, and I, I have to, in terms of, I get to, I get the opportunity to do this, to work on it. But he wanted me to look in the mirror at rehab and say, I love you. And look into my eyes in the mirror. And I had to say it three times. I had to say it in the morning and at night. And at first I felt like, okay, I'm doing this like, you know, whatever, some kind of a weird game. I'm like, you know, drawing spirits into this bathroom or so. I didn't know what was happening. But even though I didn't believe it when I started, I believed that maybe it actually would do something. And I wasn't sure what that looked like. And I, you know, felt really awkward, but I did it anyway. And what's funny is that was the hardest one for me. But if I look back and I'm really honest with myself, I would say that that is where my self-love actually like was planted you know, where it was like, it took time to grow and nurture it. And, and like you, um, you know, I'm kind of like a kitchen sink girl. I'm going to throw everything I can at my recovery just because why wouldn't I like, I love being sober and the gifts that it's given me and I want more. So it's like, I'm just going to keep searching and searching and talking to people. And what are you reading? What are you doing? Oh, cool. I've not done that yet or whatever. And so to have to have the ability to be able to remember, oh, yeah, I can do that. I can I can throw all these tools at it and I can see what happens. It's like when I look back, I can see, yeah, that's where that was planted. And I it's like sometimes I just need to back it up, back it up and go to basics again. Maybe we need to just plant another seed, Amy. You know what I mean? And so I love hearing that. I just love it. And then at night, the word at night, um, when people give you their word, is that something that they have kind of cultivated during the day or looking back over their day? They're like, ah, I worked hard, so I'm dedicated, as you said. Or what does it just kind of make itself known? Because I believe in that, you know, it's like. I find the nighttime one not many people stick with. Okay. I don't know why I've tried that with men going back to your looking in the mirror step. Yes. What I've um, heard and what I've asked different men to do, which they find easier than looking in the mirror and saying, I love you is high-fiving themselves in a mirror in the morning, which is the beginning of planting that other seed because they just, you know, women and men, I find it's a very, there's a big difference on how they do different things. Yes. 
And so, but the, the nighttime one I find is hard. So I don't really, I always send one. And normally I'll be very, very diligent on doing it for 21 days with somebody. And then if I see they're really not doing it, sometimes I will pull back because I feel like it's not until I pull back a little bit that they go, oh, I and even my kids, I did it with them for six months. And when I stopped, because they stopped writing the words, um, they said, what are you doing, mom? Why aren't you doing this anymore? We like that. And the people I do it with also all of a sudden go, wow, that kind of made me feel good. It made me think or whatever. And to me, the nighttime one is just as important or if not more, because it just allows you to sleep with some sort of peace and remembering something good about yourself. But, you know, people, we all start where we start and we all do our journey the way that works the best for us. So I try not to judge. And, you know, I have people that I did it with for three weeks and then we come back a year later and say, oh, you, could we do this again? And I say, sure thing, let's do it again. And so it's kind of like a catch up of what's happened in their life also in the last. So it really is this sober community that we have to me. And I've got, I am very blessed with the people around me in my life. But the people that I have met in the last 11 years, I have to say, are the most creative, the most genuine, the kindest, the most sensitive people I've ever met in my life. I love it. I love it so much. And the self-esteem piece. Yeah. Oh, boy, is that key. It's just so key. And I think, um, you know, for me, I will tell people that I sponsor, like, don't, you know, don't talk to my friend that way when they say something negative about themselves. And I have to remind myself to do that too. Mm -hmm. Like, don't talk about my friend that way, you know, yes. look in the mirror um, yes. because I think it's just easy to, you know, I just really had no idea how self-critical I was. And, but you're right. It's like in order to be of service or to be my best self where I can give to others and, you know, be loving and kind. I got to be filling myself up, you know, and whatever shape that takes, but I need to be open to that. And so I, I love what you're saying. And I think that, you know, for me, um, I look back to it, like reasons why I drank so much and, you know, I really believe it was partially because of a profound loneliness and I mean loneliness between myself and others and a loneliness like for myself, like me missing out on who I was and was becoming as a person because I really didn't have a connection with who I was. And I was kind of afraid of myself. Like I was in a transition of growth when I was uh, drinking at my largest capacity. And I was afraid to face that. I just didn't, I didn't know what to do with it. So I just tried to keep it at bay. Like, oh, I'm going to just, no, I, I, I don't know who, who is knocking at the door. Like who is this next version, this next chapter of me who's coming to make herself known like I couldn't embrace it. I couldn't figure that out. So now at almost 13 years sober, it's like, even in the time that I've been sober, I mean, I've had, boom, I mean, lots of Amy's come knocking at the door, like just different Amy's who I did not expect different sides of me. Um, and they're all part of one soul, but it just was kind of like I was not prepared for that. So I love that, you know, we get to do this thing. We get to see what is revealed next, whatever that may be. And I think that the words 
sound like such an amazing pathway to that place. Yeah, because words are powerful. Yeah. But I think that, you know, I am very, um, I always thought I was not good enough, not tall enough, not slim enough, not mm -hmm. pretty enough, not smart enough. And I still get into that cycle. So it's okay for me to share that also with people to say, yeah, it, we are a work in progress. Yeah. You know, I don't get up every morning and think, oh, yes, I'm all that. No, I don't. <laughs> Unfortunately, I wish I thought I was all that. But it helps me help others. And when they're help getting something, I get something back. Yeah. I think I get more back, actually, than they totally. do. Yeah. And that fills me up. Because people say, well, you know, you must get tired. You know, you've got people that are five hours, you know, uh, ahead of you you've got to catch up you've got to get up early and I but they don't get that it feels that's where I get filled up because without that I think I would go back into that I'm not good enough and the drinking for me was when I did cancer events raising money or things that I did in those days or parties made me feel like I was good enough right I was fun. I could dance better you know all those things and I found out I'm much better without it, quite honestly. I totally get it. I know. I think back to like, I thought I was pretty darn glamorous, like, you know, and now I'm like, oh, I'll even see pictures, you know, from back oh. in the day. And I'm like, bless her heart. Bless her heart. Like, ugh. <laughs> it was like a hot mess. Yeah, And, you know, I think, too, now there's people like I'm, I'm going to be interviewing somebody that's just done a sober wedding. And I can't wait to hear about that, because to me also sobriety and, and healing, because, you know, mental health plays into it. What a way to never miss another memory, you know, and others like that, that that page in your book where it says healing generations to come it gets me every time because that's what it is that's what it is yeah yep it's so true changing up the entire dance and just going you know what yeah it's okay to not feel okay and it's okay to mm -hmm. say that and talk about that and we'll get through it yeah. you know i mean I think that that's just such a different, um, it's a different perspective, you know, than like my mom's generation, my grandma's generation, where, you know, you sort of like were more polished up in those generations and you kind of didn't say anything about yeah. it. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, so fascinating. What is next for Sober is the new cool? Are you in a great, it sounds like you have a great thing going, like in terms of maybe you're like, hey, I'm in a great spot and this is what I do kind of thing. Or do you have sort of um, goals, you know, lofty goals beyond that? Because I, I don't really have a lot of goal goals. I just want to connect with people, which is what I love, but but some people are like, hey, I'm going to start a talk show and I'm going to write 50 books. And so just curious, what's next for Sober is the New Cool? More of the same or other things? You know what? I have, I, you know, when people ask me to do events or help them with events or whatever, I always say yes. I just do. And um, I love what I do. And, you know, I just... You know, every time I think, okay, people say, okay, you know, you're doing all this. You're not, you should be like getting like a vision or, you know, a vision board and goals and all this. And, and I, I, I kind of sometimes go, yeah, maybe I should do that. And then I go, no, no, no. Somehow, some way, I just know that I'm on the right path Yeah. and opportunities are everywhere. And I think as long as I'm doing some good in this world, how can it be wrong? And somehow, some way, I don't know, I just keep ending up in the right place and meeting the right people. So, you know, I, I would love to become a nonprofit. We did try to do that in, in, in Canada. 
um, and our Canadian government finally did a declaration for Sober is the New Cool because we did not have an international recovery date, believe it or not. So that was really huge. So I'm hoping to do more recovery walks and more things like that. And just really, I mean, end this stigma of, of such negativity and let's just get well. And because I really believe this world needs it more now than ever to, for people to help one another. You know, and I heard the other day from somebody that runs all these treatment centers across the United States and Canada that the COVID effect will be really, we will see what it's done to mental health and addiction in five years, not just now. And that scared me. I got to tell you that really scared me. And I thought, okay, back to work, you know, and even when I lost my natty last week, I thought, okay. I'm not, you know, I got to step back. I got to, and then I thought, no, addiction and mental health don't take days off, you know, so we got to just keep going. So uh, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going, I'm just going. <laughs> addiction and mental health don't take days off. No, nope. I mean, that is, that's the quote of the day for sure. That's so true. And you're so right. And it almost makes me say, as we start wrapping up, it's like, okay, I'm capable. I am capable of doing it another day, another day, another day. And I am also capable of ignoring, you know, what comes at me that I'm perceiving as negative or I'm perceiving as maybe like, oh, a sign that I should stop do like, no, 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 no. Like, no, I don't need to let that noise interfere with what I'm doing. I'm capable of doing this another day. So yeah. I just think that that is a huge thing to have said because, yeah, I mean, you're spot on, spot on. And I'm so sorry for the loss that you experienced. But we have to honor those angels. Yeah. We have to honor those angels because- they did fight hard. They tried their yeah. best. And that too, we can't, I don't, I, you know, I said I have to write something for the memorial service. And I thought, oh, I was so, I, I just didn't know. And then I said, no, I'm going to see her in every ray of sunshine. I'm going to see her in every raindrop. I'm going to see her in every leaf that falls. I'm going to see her, you know, in the water, glistening water, because that's what I want to remember all the good things about her. And then I'll feel like she's still with me. And I do, I believe, you know, she really still is with me. And she somehow gave me the strength to keep going because I, I really didn't want to. And, you know, all those angels deserve to be remembered, I think. Yes, they do. Listeners, can you see why Kim is an angel to me? I just cannot tell you, Kim, what it has been like sharing this time and this space with you. I adore you. I love the positivity that you bring, regardless of where you are and what you do. You touch so many lives. And I love the unique way that you do it. And I am so blessed to have intersected with you um, I just can't even tell you how much I cannot wait to continue my journey and know that I've now met you. And so we can be on sort of sober treadmills next to each other, mm -hmm. which is what I always say, you know, with another kindred spirit that I meet, it's like, oh my God, we're all on different journeys, but we're heading in similar directions, you know, and we're doing this recovered lifestyle together, even though we may be doing totally, you know, different things or um, trying different, you know, modalities or whatever it is. Oh my God, to be walking away from that prison of addiction or shame or overuse of, alcohol in whatever forms or substances in whatever forms to be walking together. You know, it's that whole concept of rowing in the same direction. 
like, you know, to do it together. What a gift. What a gift. And so I just want to thank you for coming on today, Kim. You're just such a sunshine. I just adore you. Thank you. Well, thank you. And you know, I knew the moment I had you that we would be forever sisters. Oh, me too. I love you, love you. And so everybody who's listening, um, this is again, this is Kim Bellis. And she is sober is the new cool. And Kim, where can people follow you? Okay, so I'm on Instagram and it's sober is the new cool with a period in between each word. We do have merchandise, but let's get something clear. The merchandise that I have, whether it's hats, t-shirts, hoodies, whatever, all the proceeds go back to mental health and addiction. So, um, you know, that's what we do. And we're just trying to help as many people as we can. And you know what? I'm just so blessed to have been here. And I thank you so much for having me, Amy. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. So on that note, be kind, rewind. Thank you for the honor of your time. Take what you like and leave the rest behind. Thank you so much for listening to Eternally Amy, a mum of AIDS journey from jail to joy. Amy Liz Harrison is a best-selling author, speaker, 12-step coach, meditation teacher, and recovery advocate. To find out more, please visit amylizharrison.com. You can keep up with Amy on all platforms by following at Amy Liz Harrison. Please subscribe and review this podcast. It means so much to us if you do.